Let's wander over a succession of rocks as we might find them in the field and make some general observations about the different types we come across. Looking at this structure here, I've got two very pronounced sets of joints that I can see. The dominant set running down the centre produces almost a channel in the middle of this structure. And perpendicular to those on the edge of the structure, I've got the, a number of these joints that are running across the body. If I look at this rock in hand specimen, it's crystalline, it's non-foliated, which suggests to me I'm dealing with an igneous rock. It's quite dark in colour. It's got a high mafic content, and that would suggest it's basaltic in type. But I'd need a thin section to be absolutely sure. It does give me a clue, though, as to the origin of these joints. They're almost certainly cooling joints developed within the magma. To imagine what we're seeing here, let's think of a wall that's extending a couple of kilometers out into the sea and a couple of kilometers into the land. It's a dike, an igneous intrusion that's been injected into the crust as a linear feature, discordant with the bedding on either side of it. In addition to being able to identify it as an igneous rock, we can also tell something of the age relationship. For the igneous rock to inject into the crust, the sediments must be there. And therefore, this dike has to be younger than the rocks into which it's intruded. Now let's look at the rocks into which the dike was intruded. They're eroded by the sea, but you can still get a sense of bedding. The topmost unit is a very coarse sandstone with angular grains of quartz, some of which are up to a centimetre in diameter. Beneath that, a coarse sandstone, and beneath that, a finer sandstone. At the very base, is a fine-grained siltstone. We often find sandstones of varying grain size and siltstones interbedded, indicating changes in depositional environments. Look at the junction at the base of the coarse sandstone. The erosive nature of this junction is shown by the way the base of the sandstone cuts down through the underlying layers. Whereas in the conglomerate we inferred a channel deposit, here we can actually see the channel itself. Nearby, we find a few more rock types. Notice the bedding, a clue that we're still dealing with sedimentary rocks. Let's look for some other clues. These rocks are clearly very well bedded, but the problem I'm having here is that they're extremely weathered on the surface and I'm finding it difficult to identify exactly what these rocks are. The only thing I can do is to try and get a fresh surface, and there's only one way I can do that. This is now a beautiful grey, fresh surface. It's glinting with uh, skeletal material showing. There's a very obvious test I can do here. I'm going to use acid to see if there's a reaction. And, oh yeah, it's fizzing like fury. Oh, this is a limestone, without any doubt. Sometimes, the relationship between two lithologies is very instructive. Here, for example, is a sandstone overlain by a black rock, which I'm sure you'll easily recognise. It's a coal, ironically preserved because of the seawall that's been built on top of it. Coals typically form as an accumulation of plant material. In the underlying sandstone, we have evidence of plant rootlets. And the sandstone is rich in organic matter, which ends up as black carbonaceous material. Within the space of 200 metres, we've seen a sandstone, a siltstone, a limestone bed and a coal. A fascinating succession of different depositional environments. 
Clearly, for the most part, these sediments were deposited on land. The coals, the sandstones with their channel structures and rootlet beds all support this idea. But the limestone contains fossils that indicate it was marine. To put these two ideas together, one plausible hypothesis is that we're dealing with a delta system, which was occasionally inundated by the sea. And then 200 million years later, igneous activity and the vertical intrusion of a dike. And if we glance behind at the huge cliffs of Fair Head, we can see the horizontal intrusion of a rather large sill. So clearly working in the field is very good. We can get a lot of experience from actually examining rocks, not just in terms of describing them, but more importantly in terms of being able to identify field relationships between one rock and other rocks in the sequence. It's all part of what we geologists refer to as getting your eye in. <laughs>